Okay, so we're now at 8.30, so we should start. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who's joining us today. Um, all of the attendees are coming in. Um, they kind of jumped up now, so hello to all of you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope to have a fun chatty session today about some wines that some of you have been able to um, buy, which is uh, really exciting because then you can taste as we talk about them. Um, I'd also really like to um, welcome uh, Ben from Novel Wines, um, who has helped me sort out, you know, getting all the wines out to people who want to taste them. These are all wines that I've um, sh showcased at my pop-up wine bars before. So, you know, they're, they're ones that I recommend already. Um, I also want to, of course, welcome Amelia Singer, who is joining us um, from LA, also in lockdown with different rules. And it's, you know, it's great to have her on board. Um, great to have another chatty, friendly face uh, to the party because, um, you know, love having her around. And uh, Amelia has also um, recently launched a, uh, a wine course online. So if anyone's kind of bored at the moment looking for something else to do learning with the experts is it learning with the experts Dr. learning Paul? with experts yeah learning, learning with, with experts. experts thank you um and you know it's a fantastic way to um learn more about uh about tasting wine and uh being confident to buy it order in the restaurant things like that so you know should be a fun course and then we've also got um two producers with us. So we've got Miha from the Istanich Winery, he's the CEO. The Istanich is the uh, rosé sparkling that we're going to be um, talking about this evening. And then we also have Marissa Leo from Colomba Bianca, who is the export manager, and uh, will be talking to us about the Nero Davila that we have. So that's really exciting to have all of you here. I'm really looking forward to the show. And uh, the, the theme for tonight is an adventure in the old world. And, you know, the way that, you know, people that know me know that I love new world wines. Um, but it's not that I love only new world wines. I like the wines that have kind of more of the new world about them. Um, and what we're doing today is we're going through the old world into more unusual or lesser known areas of the old world and also lesser known grapes. So for example, in Italy, um, you know, most people think of the North, but today we're going down South and, you know, I wanted to explore that with you. So um, looking forward to talking about all of those. Um, just wanted to um, let everyone say a quick hello um, because some people might be viewing this in as gallery um, where you can see all of us at the same time. That's how I'm going to be recording it and uh, putting it up on uh, YouTube later. Um, if you're looking at in the other view, you'll only see who's talking. So I'll just let everyone say a quick hello um, and, then, and then we'll start on the wine. So Ben. Hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Soma. And it's great to see me, her, Marissa and Amelia as well. Um, I'm Ben from Novel Wine, so I'm the guy who's been <laughs> trying to send out your wine this week and, and hopefully you've all received it. Uh, uh, it's been one hell of a week, but we are specialists in uh, lesser known wines and weird and wonderful wines. So it's exciting to be able to share a Slovenian Fizz, an Austrian Gruner and a lovely Nero Dabla from Sicily. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to see uh, what you think of them and also to have a chat and uh, answer any questions you might have about where you can find interesting wines like this. And Amelia, do you want to say a quick hello? Hi guys. Um, so I'm not probably going to be on the wine just yet. It is only um, midday here, but it's so lovely to be connected back to um, yeah, the UK contingent. I miss you guys, but this is a wonderful way to connect with producers from around the world and join up forces with Soma, who I adore. So no, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, Marissa, do you want to say hello? 
Hello everyone and thank you for inviting me and it's, uh, it's, it's great to be together to join this, this moment, enjoying wines and uh, just I can't wait to, to hear about you and uh, to, to talk about the, the story of the brand. Thank you. And Miha? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be to 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 be that it's possible for for me and for my family and for our production of sparkling wines from Slovenia to be also participating in this uh, very special event for the first time uh, in uh, like we are doing tonight. And I hope that everybody will enjoy um, and uh, that also that will first enjoy enjoy also the wine tasting and also enjoy our wines in the future and also that uh, that everybody will learn something new from 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 this uh, event tonight thank you okay so the first um wine we're going to be talking about and if people want to um pop it open and have a have a taste um is the Istanich uh, gourmet rosé and i first tasted this um very recently at um or rather recently at the people's choice wine awards where it was a finalist um and it opened my eyes to it and i have since um served it at a tasting since um and amelia actually presented at that which was quite quite fun to see her there um yeah so it's uh, ben would you like to give us the uh tasting notes for that one yeah of course so um the isnich gourmet rose most of you will have the 2015 it's one of my favorite sparkling wines uh and i think that's because there's a real intensity of fruit on the palate so because it's made with free one free run pinot noir juice uh, you have a really ripe aroma of raspberries and cream on the nose, um, but it's really creamy and fresh in the mouth. It's like a great champagne, but it also has that really nice youthful racy note. Um, think pink grapefruit, red currants, that sort of thing. It lifts the whole experience and makes it a really refreshing, quite bright, sparkling wine. Um, so it's great to drink on its own, but it's got the kind of zing and character to go really well with food. Um, and you can try it with slightly deeper cuisines as well. So most people, or at least I tell people to pair their fizz with fish and chips and things, but um, this is a real ripeness of fruit. So it goes with uh, deeper dishes, uh, cherry tomatoes with uh, lovely baked grilled fish or something like that would be nice. Uh, salmon, oily salmon works really well with uh, Miha's wine. Um, so yeah, it, the key thing about this I think is that really nice ripe intensity of fruit which is excellent. Thank you, Thank you. and then um, Miha would you like to talk us through a little bit about the Istanich winery? Yeah sure uh, so uh, I have prepared also some facts about Slovenia if we have time but I can start also with a description on, on um, how it happened uh, with us and uh, when, it, when did we start so actually we were the first private producer in ex Yugoslavia, so we started uh, producing uh, sparkling wines in 1968. Uh, my father was a very famous uh, goalkeeper who was also playing uh, uh, at the Chelsea Stadium, Stanford Bridge, against England in 1958. But later, he decided to, to also to to go for, he wanted first to be a doctor, but uh, he couldn't play football and, and also study medicine. So then he switched to what we do now. And I'm very, very grateful for, to him that he changed his opinion and that we are able to produce this fantastic stuff, what we are doing. So on the September 28, 1968, uh, my sister was born and uh, on this occasion my father made first 100 bottles of sparkling wine Barbara. Barbara is also my sister name. And since then we were producing and uh, using sparkling wines uh, every year. And also uh, from first 100 bottles we have now more than half a million bottles on stock. And so and we are producing 15 different uh, brands of sparkling wines. But we all, in, 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 every, in every direction we go, we want to be really the best. We want to go for, for the best. And uh, also in 2017, uh, there was a choice uh, made, there was one research made uh, by famous uh, Spanish producer, Gramola. 
and uh, that in, in, uh, in this occasion we we were re realized as one of 20 best sparkling wine producers of the world. So it it was um, quite a, a big history, but we were all the time doing and all the time we were focused on what we do and we want really to create bubbles as good as possible. So the good thing is that we are always searching to find the for the best uh, sparkling wine, but we have never achieved. That's why we are also very much more motivated to do to be to do even better and better. And also now after 50 years, we changed a, a lot. We now have sold or cut half of our vineyards. We are going with new, new plants. We are going on better terroir because we really want to make a unique and authentic sparkling wines of the area. Yeah, and I, I I really love it. Like I, I love the I love the flavour profile. I love the the texture of it. And with it being um, uh, traditional method, you know, you're getting that complexity in it. So I, you know, I think it's a fantastic wine. And I think you know, you mentioned it's it's expensive, but actually for a traditional method wine, it's not expensive at all. I mean, Amelia, you're shaking your head. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's really, really not. Um, no, I mean, particularly if, if you think of the equivalent of traditional method, that basically means it's made in the same way as they make champagne. The secondary fermentation happens in bottle. And that means that then the juice of the grapes is, remains in contact with the dead yeast cells, which gives it that extra structure, as you say. It gives it the kind of yeasty, nutty elements, the creamy texture, which people love. So it really, really stands out because I've had other, I've actually had another sparkling 100% Pinot Noir from Slovenia before from Puklovec in France. Which is lovely and, and, and fruity, but it just doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have the long finish. It doesn't have the same structure, as you say. And there's also a lovely savory element, too, which, you know, Ben mentioned how versatile it was with food. And um, when I think of the equivalent kind of blonde noirs from champagne, I mean, they can easily, easily be 60, 70, 80 pounds. You know? So, um, I mean, were you the first people to really do traditional method, Miha, when it came to sparkling wine? So it, actually, the, the 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 traditional method is um, the the, say the 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 less expensive way to produce sparkling wines. But uh, you can do that these sparkling wines very quickly. When we were for many years, we were the one and only private producer. Like now we have about on uh, domestic market because we are only two million people. Now we have more than three hundred producers producing sparkling wine by traditional method. But uh, I have uh, one remark. So you can produce wine with bubbles or you can produce sparkling wine. It's completely different approach to the same material and the result is completely different. And we have one problem, which are also some, sometimes problem for the banks because what we are doing, so we have to release our wines after three, four years. And after three, four years, then we get the, the, what you were both or you all uh, three were talking about these wines. And there was a question also, why can we, why don't we use a uh, method charma or, or something else? So for us, we were wine brokers. We were also, my father was a manager of big company, but we, for, for what we do, it was never the question. Only traditional method is the, is the question of what we want to do. Because when I, I have to drink something, which is, uh, uh, no, which is not traditional method for me is uh, quite a lot of, of time. I, I need to have a traditional method. I start with traditional method and then we can say, we can say about a different wine, what kind of wine is that and what do we really get from, from, from that? Because our lives are too short to drink bad wines. I completely agree with that statement. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and how, what would you enjoy with this wine? Because we've talked about like how savory, interesting. Like what in your like what is your favorite dish with this wine? You know, I always uh, I'm very big fan of, of uh, fish. I like uh, white fish, and I also like the blue fish. And uh, for me, any kind of blue fish with this wine is matching perfectly. But also on the other side, some chefs have done only also very good desserts with 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 this wine. Um, also, we are sometimes we are cooking with this wine because it has a it has a very nice structure. It has a very nice acidity. It has a, also these uh, small bubbles 
are making all the dishes more fluffy. And uh, that's why, you know, you can make a, a, a quite a very wide range of, of, of dishes you can, you can do with this wine. I noticed, because you make a lot of different um, sparkling wines, and some of your wines you have the native grape, I'm going to mispronounce it, Rumeni, Rumini? Uh, Rumeni Plavet. Yes. What does that do to the wine? Because I've seen that some of your wines has a blend with, with the Rumeni. You know, for, for example, if you beheld uh, sparkling wine number one, number one is made of three varieties. One is uh, Chardonnay, 60% Chardonnay. Chardonnay gives elegance to the wine. Then we have Pio Noir, which gives body to, to, to the sparkling wine. And then we have Romani Plavets, which uh, gives uh, freshness and also uh, uh, fr fruitiness. So it's, uh, when we combine all these varieties, it's, uh, then we get uh, something uh, which is very internationally, uh, internationally renowned, but also very, very, very uh, terroir oriented or very authentic uh, sparkling wine. We like to do with, with, with uh, sparkling wines from Italy, many plants. We also do some sparkling wines with Blau Frankish, Blue Frank. Oh, wow. Which is, which is also, we are blending a part of that. Also gives some authentic because you know, the uh, recently DNA re uh, research made that, uh, shown up that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Blue Frank or Blau Frankish is, is wine which is originating from it's, it's indigenous variety from Slovenia. Austria, Austria. Yeah, or Hungary or whatever, but um, yeah. That's like it. biased. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's why. That's, but the many planets I think is uh, the future of our area because uh, it has, it's, been, it's been all many years, for more than 200 years has been here. And uh, the, 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 there was always a part of something. The, the variety has survived. And also it's uh, because of these uh, climatic changes, this wine is giving uh, a very uh, special potential on, 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 the, on the freshness of, of the sparkling wine or the still wines as well. Because before, okay. in, in 40 years ago, this wine could very difficult, it's, it would be very rare that it would get to 10% alcohol. But now we can have 10.5, 11, and this is very good for the future of sparkling wines. I think also if you can get a sense of terroir, which you're talking about in your sparkling wines, that will set you apart because, you know, talking to um, English sparkling wine producers or other sparkling wine producers, I did a project for Moet uh, Chandon in Argentina before, and, um, you know, it's... It, it seems like the debate is always champagne and all other traditional methods from all around the world. If you can break out from that group, then, you know, I think you're, I think you're getting ahead of the game. Yeah, we are, we, what, that's what we want to, to do. We want to, 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 to change this dogma that only the good sparkling wine can, can come only from, from champagne. We are also producing on the other part of the world, a very good. Plus, we have a very, very, it's, we don't have chalk, but we have the, the subsoil is very close to what they are having in Champagne, with the same conditions. So we are, that's why we are, we, 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 we don't have problems with producing good sparkling wines. The, the next things are just to develop and also to have some focus what to do, because we don't, we, we, we can be the same, and that would be all, all, only new to product, but we also want to develop something new to bring something extra, something, some, some novelty to the, to, the, to the world of sparkling wines. And we want that the people will remember us this way. Yeah. That's great. Um, I look forward to hearing what people who are tasting at home have to say about it. I'll do, um, I'll do any Q&As um, or comments as we go through, but then also at the end, um, we can leave, you know, a chunk at the end to have a session then um, to talk about it a bit more. So first of all, we'll just go through each of the three wines. So the next, uh, the next one that we have is the Johann Donnerbaum. Um, which is a Gruner Veltliner from um, Austria, and um, oh, cling cling. Uh, <laughs> um, and I love it. The, the the way I came across that wine um, 
again was through um, Ben at Normal Wines. And what I was doing was I was creating a session for Marlowe Wine Society, I live in Marlowe, um, which was um, to do with the production of wine. And what I really wanted to find was a wine that really showed off the uh, the pepper, the white pepper characteristic, so that I could talk to those um, talk to the, those people about about it, and it went down um, really well in terms of um, both the the topic, but also the wine as well. So Ben, would you like to tell us a little bit about this one, please? Yeah, sure. Um, that, that's pretty much the main reason why we stopped the the Johan Donovan is. Uh, a lot of our gruners are quite peachy. They come from the Wagram area where it's quite sandy, uh, a bit more warmer climate, a little bit juicier in style. Um, but I prefer more savoury styles of wine. Uh, I really like uh, the spicy notes in wine. Um, so I wanted a gruner, like like you say, that really shows off the pepper. Um, and Johan Donovan kind of does that really well. So his vines are on the hillsides in the Spritzer Valley. Um, so it's a much leaner style as well. Instead of peachy fruit, you get kind of really nice green apple and lime. So it's got a lovely zingy backbone to it. Um, but then you get these pops of cardamom, that slightly floral, um, spicy note, but then that lovely white pepper over quite a flinty finish. So it's really fresh and savory on, on the end. Um, so if you're looking for a really refreshing Gruner Veltliner that isn't in the primary peachy fruit style, um, Johan Donovan is kind of the perfect representation of a really spicy, savory, lean Gruner Veltliner if you haven't tried that style before. So it's like a stepping stone because um, you can go sometimes really expensive like you can with Riesling with Gruner Veltliner. Um, but Johan Donovan is a really nice entry point for that different style. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it as a um, way to get into it because mm. you know I haven't tried a lot of um, gruners before. Um, I do know that they're they're kind of getting more on the marketplace. Um, not really seeing them in restaurants yet. I mean, Amelia, you're a you're a fan of gruner. Where have you seen it? I love gruner. I mean, as you might have picked up from a comment earlier, tongue in cheek comment earlier. Um, my dad's family actually from Austria, Hungary, so we go to Austria every year. And I very much enjoy trying different gruners there because Austria only exports 10% of what they produce. They know that they're onto a good thing. So even though Gruner Veltliner is the most widely planted grape, there a third of all plantings are Gruner. Um, you don't see that much. I think for a number of reasons too, like in um, the probably Austrians won't want me to bring this up, but in 1985, there was a bit of an anti-freeze scandal where some... Austrian wine wineries were illegally adulterating their wines with an ingredient which I wrote down here, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it, it's a toxic substance called diethylene glycol, which is a primary ingredient in antifreeze, and they were basically adulterating their wine, sending it off to Germany, and Germany were basically mixing it and blending it with German wines, and then they were selling them off to the public. Now, no one died from it or whatever, but they were... <laughs> It was still expensive. not very nice. <laughs> it's still not great. It's really not good for PR. Weird that. And um, it really, really decimated um, Austrian exporting their wine for a good 10 years, I would say. I think partly they didn't export them much, partly by having an antifreeze scandal that's never great for PR. And then the third thing I think too was just Quite frankly, and I would have to say this, having a European father who had me tasting wines from all around the world from a very young age, I was very spoiled. He traveled a lot with work and really I thought it was normal to be trying wines from Austria, Germany, Spain. But I would say England and definitely English wine critics and wine writers, they really weren't interested in, in Austrian wine, particularly when they had France and they had Italy and Spain, they got more excited by those. And then it was only really in 2002 when an Austrian dentist and wine importer decided to do this uh, kind of a bit like Judgment of Paris style competition. So instead of um, doing blind tasting of Austrian uh, Gruners with amazing worldwide international Chardonnay blends. And he did this, he did this experiment around the world and in he, the one in London, people like Francis Robinson could actually get together and choose amazing white burgundies, which they put, you know, in the lineup. 
And it was amazing. Actually, the majority of wines which came out top were from Austria. And I think it was then that really shocked. She said, Jan- for Jancis Robinson, definitely, that was her, like, hallelujah moment. She'd always been a Riesling fan. She'd always been like, German Riesling, German Riesling, German Riesling. And just kind of thought, we're really mad, so, you know. It's, it's, it's a bit of a try hard, it's not really a contender. And then that really made her realize, wow, it's an amazing noble grape. And actually it's got even more ageability than most Chardonnay. I think that's also something which when I go, so I think that helped, you know, then the press got excited. Sommeliers are excited by it because it is so food friendly. You know, Ben, you mentioned the kind of peppery style and the savory elements. Um, you can also have really, well, I love like the ripe and opulent elements where you do get the peachy and ageability. I've, you know, um, this last trip in Austria, I was trying gorgeous wines from 2002 from F- FX Pischler, which, you know, kind of almost take on like a Riesling-esque baked apple and um, kind of oatmeal-y texture. It's, a, it's amazing. And it is also arguable to say that as well as aging, as long as Riesling Gruner is actually more consistent in the way it ages because like reason can go through dumb phases and, and you do get more of the earthy minerality um you do get kind of a peatiness whereas like reason you get more of like a kerosene thing as it ages so i don't know i find it um fascinating sadly you don't see many of the aged gruners personally i think the austrians are smart and hold on to it for most of themselves so the ones which you do see in the restaurants and in the wine shops will be the young ones which can still be fantastic but as even the riper richer opulent ones they can be pricey you, know, you can easily buy them for 80 90 pounds uh from knoll and pischler and Herzberger and you know all the top names but it is a no- i think it is a noble grape in my opinion it, it's it's so versatile its age is just incredible it ages incredibly um and uh, no, it's, it's just it's just a fun alternative. But then the light peppery one, it's great for people who want something different to Sauvignon Blanc or Picapool or Vermentino. You know, it, it has that tangy, coquettish, uh, you know, fun, light, zesty touch to it. Yeah, and that's that's how I often um, bring it into tastings or conversations. Is is with um, you know when people say, oh. I normally drink New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and want something else. And, you know, it's one of the alternatives that I suggest. But like Ben was saying, this one's a very peppery one. And, you know, I'm a big fan of this one. Um, But there are other styles and um, like the more peachy ones. And were you saying that it's the more peachy, the more fruity ones that will actually age longer because that fruit holds? Um, Actually, I think you can have wonderful aged wines, you know, I mean, I think it's more to do with the acidity that helps it age. If it's been in the old oak food risk, that kind of helps give texture to, and really the sight expression. Um, so I think they'll age, but they might age a bit differently. So maybe the more peachy ones, they'd be more opulent and honeyed, like baked honeyed apple kind of mm-hmm. thing. Whereas ones from like another different type of soil, you get more emphasis on the kind of peaty qualities. And, you know, so then the earthiness will show through but in just like a, a different, more savory-esque way. But um, it's, yeah, I would love to try more. It's so hard. We actually, the only way we get hold of these older vintages is where we go, we always go to the same place like skiing every year. And there's like a spa supermarket. If, and um, we're like buddies with like the guy who works in the supermarket and he has like an offside like sides business. And he's like, ah, you know, Amelia. Like he's, he's my dad and I, he's like, here's my inventory list of what he has in the basement. So like, that's like the only way I've been able to try really good. It's, it's literally like, you know, trying to find, oh, of course, like if you're friends with winemakers or, you know, producers and that helps, but it is really hard to get hold of the older stuff. Um, so you really have to go over there. Like we're not going to be able to just find it in a shop here. <sighs> well, maybe Berry Brothers and things. I mean, Ben, what would you say? You'd probably know more about this than me in terms of where people could, I mean, uh, I I love stuff like this. When someone says they can't find something, something in my head goes, hey, novel wines, that sounds perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We've kind of, when we set up the business three and a half, four years ago, the whole point of it was to bring bring in stuff that no one could find. Um, So we started with Hungary and most of our, most of our wine is Hungarian. But um, yeah, I mean, as soon as a customer or anyone says they can't find something, it's, something we seek out and look to do and because we work with quite boutique small wineries anyway um we can work on smaller volumes which means if the austrians want to drink it all themselves which is a common problem with the croatians as well 
um, <laughs> as as long as we can have a, a little bit, um, then we, we've got some to start introducing it uh, into the UK. And anyone who's curious uh, will, will get the opportunity to try it. So I, I, I love stuff like that, where if it's not here yet, um, we'll probably find a way to bring it in and share it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great news. So yeah, everyone watch this space and uh, check in with them. Are there them. designations in Austrian wine, I think? Someone, are, we, are we doing Q&A later in general? Oh, it's someone like, asked for Q&A. Yeah. I don't know if we were doing that at the end or if we're doing it now. Yeah, you can you can answer that one now because it's, it's still relevant to this section, yeah? Yeah, actually, due to the 19th, someone just asked if there are any designations in Austrian wine. There are so many designations, there are so many regulations, and it was actually due really to the 1985 antifreeze scandal that Austria was like, right, we need to clean up our image, we need to clean up our wines, we're going to get super serious. So actually, I would say it's one of the most regulated and designated um, countries in Europe uh, for wine. And particularly the Vakal is very interesting where this wine is from because the, the designations are literally the different single sites and, and where wine, like when they put on a bottle, sadly I don't have the, the Gruner bottle um, on, um, with me, but it will actually say the specific sites and the names of sites are, reflect the soil or the personality and nature of that site. Um, and, and it really comes, some of them, from as early on as the 13th century. Um, and there's about like 100, particularly in the Vaco itself, um, they're super, super strict regulated and there are about a hundred I think different designated sites um might have to check that um but no it is extremely designated so you know the antifreeze scandal had some upsides yeah yeah at least <laughs> <laughs> okay and um, we'll go on to the um third one which is the uh Columba Bianca Vitesi which is in another beautiful bottle and um, this is the Nero Davila and because it's the because uh, it's the third one I think I'm going to uh, join you guys in a little, uh, little sippage um, so uh, Marissa um, oh no first first to Ben I guess oh that did not work um, first to Ben um, can you tell us the tasting notes please yeah sure um, so Obviously, these guys will know their wine much better, but Nero Davlo is uh, from Colombo Bianca is actually one of our best-selling red wines. Um, and I think it's for one pretty good reason, which is uh, how smooth it is. Um, a lot of people kind of overlook texture, but I think it's one of the main reasons why consumers buy the wine they buy and why they stick to the wine they buy as well. Um, and Columba is, uh, Columba's Nero is kind of this really big, lovely, silky, satisfying red. Uh, you've got packs of the kind of black plum, juicy cherry, little uh, hint of warm baking spice. It feels like a, a nice big hug. Um, and we all need a hug <laughs> in these times, right? So um, I think it does so well with our customers because it's just really easy to drink, really smooth, um, still quite refreshing. So it's not moved entirely into that very, very jammy style that you get with um, overripe reds. Um, this is still quite fresh, a little bit floral on the nose, but it's got all that lovely black fruits, which uh, if I ask a lot of my customers what they like to drink, they'll say, have you got any full bodied reds? Uh, and this narrow Davila is kind of hits the nail on the head every time. Um, so that is kind of the first wine I recommend to someone who wants to try a nice full bodied red wine. Um, so yeah, uh, it's also a glass of sunshine as well which if we can't go on holiday and it's cloudy outside, uh, it's, it's pretty nice. So, um, yeah, l love this wine. And it's great value as well. I mean, it's a 10 euro bottle, so can't, can't really beat that. Marissa, can you, can you give us a little um, detail on the sunshine that you've got down there in Columba Bianca? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ben. Um, Columba Bianca is... Um, is a cooperative of uh, 2,500 wine growers. Uh, we are located in the south of Italy, in Sicily, in the west part of the island. And um, 
well, as a cooperative, we have uh, so many wine growers, 2,500 families that are part of, uh, of the company. Um, I'm going to show you um, some numbers just uh, to give you an idea of the company um, that, uh, let me see, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Can you see? It? Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. no. Okay. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also have seven thousand and five hundred hectares of vineyards, and uh, around twenty-five percent of these are um, uh, organic vineyards. So organic vineyard certified. We we are um, pretty big. I can say we cover five provinces in Sicily, and in total we have six wineries that are located in six different terroir in Sicily. Um, this is uh, the west part of Sicily. Can you see here? Um, so th these are all the wineries. Um, we have different terroirs. This make us able to produce different kinds of uh, uh, wines, styles of wines. But uh, well, this is the, the Nero Gavola. Um, however, um, uh, we are, uh, as a cooperative, um, you know, cooperative are always known as a producer of uh, bulk wine. This is how normally the, the cooperative was born, but uh, it's important for us to produce wine bottle and uh, we are very proud of the produce of, um, of the Vitese because um, it really represents our territory, our history. Also, if you see the shape of the bottle, is unusual because um, we we did a restyling of our old label, old bottle from the 70s, and just uh, because we want to bring uh, to the future, I mean, our story, our and. Uh, as you see, it's like a, a vintage style, vintage modern style. But let me see if I can share again the, the screen because I want to show you the, the, old, the old label. That uh, Let me see if I can right now again. Yes. So this was the old label, we did our styling, and uh, yes, uh, it's so the, the, also, also the, the, the tree that you see on the label is uh, a typical tree that you see around the hills of the, of the winery that is called Vitese. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, full of um, stories and history. Uh, because you can understand uh, more than 2,500 families uh, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, it's like a big family, this is the truth. And um, well, I'm, um, I'm uh, the export manager of, of, the, of the company. Actually, we sell um, all over the world our wine and um, well, we are, it's a very drinkable, easy drinking wine and um, it's, uh, it, rep it really represents, I think it really represents um, Sicily, the character of Sicily, uh, because uh, it's very full of flavors, mm -hmm. full of the sunshine and um, this, that, this is why um, we, we are all, we, we, yeah, the sunshine is uh, one element very important for the producing of, of this kind of very full, uh, full of tannin wine, intense, I can say. Uh, well. <laughs> I mean, the, the tree that you pointed out, it's nice to know the, the history of that because 
Um, it's always what I first notice, either when I'm looking online or in, because you have some, some of your wines in supermarkets over here as well. So you can spot it like really easily. So it makes it really easy, especially with the shape of the bottle as well. So it's nice to get the history behind that. Thank you. You're welcome. And Amelia, you're a, you're a fan of Sicily, aren't you? I love, I adore Sicily. I mean, it's just culture, it's such a mix of, of, of different cultures and the food is fantastic and it's beautiful and the people are great. And I just think it's, it's fantastic um, in terms of value too. I mean, it's interesting because definitely, I mean, at my sister's wedding, we had a primativo from Puglia which I also think is a lovely, big, robust red grape, which is fantastic value for money. And again, it's from the south. Most people, they think of southern Italy, they think of Tuscany, and to find bargains there, that's a lot trickier. So, you know, I also just think it's very unimaginative. I mean, Italy has over 500 grapes, you know? <laughs> like, you know, you can, like, veer out of, of, of San Giovese. Um, but, um, no, and I love Mio d'Avola. I think it is a good, like, kind of counterpart if you do, and, and it does so optic with the old vines too, that extra intensity and robust element and, and you do get the leaner styles as well um it's quite interesting seeing like you can get the more kind of fruit forward silky intense bit of oak aging or the people who want to go down the slightly leaner more cherry tart cherry herbal route as well so it's, it's a great great and it's i love the fact that too that you're a cantina because i think in lots of people's minds cooperatives which are cantinas it's almost like oh they can't produce good wine when actually over 60 percent of italian wine is made in cantinas and um and actually a lot of the time it, it produces some of the best qualities um when i think of northern italy where you've got um particularly up in alto adige and that area where you've got very physical like challenges to deal with with the mountains and things so that's why wine growers all work together but I also think, um, you know, so as well as producing good quality, by working together, as you say, you can get amazing wines for, for great value. I mean, what percentage of wine produced in Sicily would you say are, are produced by cantinas? You mean by cooperatives? Yeah, cooperatives, yeah. Is there, I can say this 70%, yes? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a lot. Yeah. Yes, because uh, there are a lot of small producers, and so they can do, they can produce the wine all alone. So uh, we bring them together all together, uh, and it's uh, and it's easier. And uh, yes, we are able uh, to, as you can, uh, as you saw from the map we have different areas we have uh, the coastal areas we have vineyards uh, up to 600 meters above the sea level so we are able to produce different uh, so many different styles of wine so it was for the red for the, for the white for sparkling as well but uh, i mean especially for the reds and this, um, this, uh, the Vitesi range, they're all organic and they're all vegan as well, aren't they? So, you know, they've kind of got a different um, ethos or personality to them. So be, having that cooperative allows you to kind of make different types of wine because you're all grouping together. Is it, is it hard to make organic wine in Sicily in terms of the terroir and climate? Well, I, I could say that it's not it's not hard i mean it's uh, a, a, as a, an organic product uh, you have to to invest uh, different uh, a lot of time also and uh, um, i mean you have to follow the nature uh, to produce organic wine in Sicily is not hard because of the climate uh, it's uh, normally very very warm so uh, this is very important to not have uh, a disease, you know, in the grapes. And so I can say that it's not hard, but as an organic product, you have to, you know, have the certification and, and do the things in the right way. And uh, um, there's a lot of regulation. Yeah. Regulation, exactly. Yeah. So in LA, everyone is very conscious of what they put in their bodies. And I was just wondering, um, 
The fact that your wines are vegan, is that something which is often asked by the consumer? Have you noticed that more recently, perhaps, that is more of a pressing concern? Well, the fact that all our, our wines are vegan, and uh, for the one that uh, what, producing vegan wine means that we don't use any clarify that comes from animals. This not affect uh, the taste of the wine, it's just uh, um, that we choose this. Um, uh, this is part of our, um, of our uh, values, of our mission to, to uh, respect, uh, to have the sustainability, to respect uh, the, the environment. Um, so this is just uh, part of our mission. Vegan wine, organic wine, and uh, what I could say about uh, also the mission is that, that when we think about uh, organic and vegan, we don't have just to think about just the consumers. We, we also think about the producers because, you know, uh, the producer that don't use any chemicals is protected. Absolutely. I mean, I, I had my worst asthma attack when I was working in a Chilean winery due to the sulfur they were using. Like, so, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it does make a difference. <laughs> also, the environment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Marisa. It's wonderful to hear about um, your wines and, and Colombo Bianca. I mean, like I said, I, I love the Vitesi range. I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I live in Marlow and um, Tom Courage has it in his restaurant. So, you know, it's kind of, it's up there, but at a very decent price. So thank you <laughs> for producing such a nice wine at this price for us. And thank you, Ben, for stocking it. Um, <laughs> uh, so we've, we're kind of wrapping it up now. That time has flown. Um, you kind of feel like you could just talk about this stuff all all night long, and I guess as as you know, wine experts we do, but um, you know, uh, not everybody does. So I'll let everybody um, carry on. <laughs> Pardon? Get to their Netflix. <laughs> yeah, go back to their Netflix parties, <laughs> and in, and enjoy the wines for the rest of the evening. Um, we haven't really had any more uh, Q and A's come through, other than ones we've answered. Just checking the Q and A box. Um, I did have um, questions beforehand um, before we started from people emailing me who who know me, and they were saying um, things like, uh, "Will we be doing?" more of these i hope so and um, we're looking into it talking to um talking to some other retailers as well to get their their wines shown because we want to support um the retailers because it's quite tough for them at the moment um independence uh, i think the supermarkets are sweeping up at the moment um and it's uh you know so we're looking for those um we've had i've had been asked about half bottles i'm investigating that because um obviously when it's not so many people coming around to your house at the moment um not able to get through although i have seen figures that uh, drinking is on the up so maybe you will be able to get through it before it before it runs out um you know and then um you know other other things can help like different bottle stops can help last them longer so um you know just uh give us a shout if you want any tips or tricks um we've also got the uh the coravan um uh which i'll put in the i'll put in the comments we've got um a 10 percent discount code if anyone wants to use that um and then yeah thanks to all the panelists for coming it's been absolutely amazing having you here like i said time has flown it's been really fast i don't know how you do this um kind of interview all the time in media because it's you just you just want to talk for forever and ever um yeah and then uh thanks to everyone for joining and then i do have a little um clip uh to put up here to say Thank you to everybody, including the NHS. Um, we did a little clap in our street earlier at uh, eight to say thank you to everyone at the NHS working, um, but also to everyone else. So um, my local postie, um, you know, and his and his team, and of course all the other postmen as well who's still going through this. I have friends who work for airlines and they've been travelling around the world getting people home. So it's been, you know, 
big round of applause to everybody who's who's been helping um, with what's going on and we'll see how these webinars kind of continue continue afterwards um, so yeah just uh, you know for more details of anything that we've mentioned tonight or the next sessions go to princessinthepino.com um, same for the uh, uh, you know any any tips or, or things moving forward including the Coravan um, Ben would you like to say a quick goodbye yeah sure uh, thanks everyone uh, for tuning in uh, big shout out to Dave from Parcel Force as well because he's been my absolute hero for the last couple of weeks um, and yeah, it was great to have uh, Marissa and Miha come in from the wineries and to uh, hear Amelia talk about the wines as well. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants any weird and wonderful wine, uh, go to Novel Wines uh, or give us a call and we'll be happy to help you out. Uh, and I am getting more stock for next week. It's coming on Tuesday, uh, but everyone keeps buying it very, very quickly. <laughs> um, I'll do my best, but thank you very much. And Amelia, would you like to say a quick goodbye? Yeah, no, I just um, just want to say thank you so much for so for having me. It was lovely meeting you guys two on the panel, and uh, definitely during this whole kind of quarantine out here, I felt like quite you know far away from the UK and the wine community. But this is why I love wine; it just brings everyone together. So thank you so much. It's been a real uh, highlight of my week. So thank you. Thank you. And Marissa, quick goodbye. Yeah, I would like to hug you all and thank you all, but uh, at the moment we can just uh, say goodbye. Thank you so much. It's, it's been amazing, very nice to share and uh, I hope to, to share again with another one, who knows? <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. I love I love your wines. And Miha, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it and love your insights on Slovenian sparkling wines. Um, I think it's a fantastic one that we've been able to share with people um, today. So thank you for sharing. Would you like to say a quick goodbye? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to be here with you tonight. So uh, my biggest wish, really biggest wish, is that we meet very soon in person. That would be my best wish for all the panelists and also for all the people who were tonight with us. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.